Jesus, as we hear your heartbeat tonight, as we feel our heart beating within us, may it match up with your heartbeat towards us. We want to know you. There's, there's no other thing in our lives that we desire more than to know you. So God, as we consider your truth, as we examine your word, and as we take it into our being, Lord, transform us, metamorphosize, change us, God. Not because of what we are is bad, change us into what you desire us to be. Call us out. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Thanks. I'm not sure if this is on or not. I mean, can you all hear me pretty well? Yeah, good? Okay, good. Normally don't do that. Exchange life. What is exchange life? Welcome to exchange life, by the way. A couple new faces. I want to start there. Um, exchange life is a Christ-centered process that delivers hope and support to anyone seeking a life Free from the snares of sin, excuse me, free from the snares of lies that limit our God-designed destiny. It was created to help you exchange agreement with lies for trust in the truth of God's word. The premise is seen throughout scripture. When people believe a lie, the liar is given authority, and that authority given to the liar then manifests in behavior contrary to who we are in Christ. So we declare one thing, but we believe another thing. We're going to act out what we truly believe in our heart. We talked about that last week. If you if you want to be part of exchanged.life, this is a plug, go ahead and go to exchanged.life, join our group, and that'll give you access to all the videos that we've ever recorded, okay? So make sure that you note that. But we are going to exchange agreement with lies for trust in the truth of God's word. I say we collectively, I choose to do it on a daily basis. And it's up to you to make that choice tonight. How do you want to respond to the truth that's being revealed to you? Because it truly is a matter of willingness. It's a matter of yieldedness. That's what we talked about. We, sur- we sang, we surrender. What are we surrendering? My way. Yeah, for his way and his preference. Corporate gathering is what you're participating in right now. There's open share groups for men and women. That's after the message. You'll hear something tonight, uh, one of the chapters generally. Sometimes we go a little bit off script. But you're going to talk about how does that apply to your life? Where have you come into agreement with a lie and want to make that exchange? Workbook with a first responder is something that you will go through if you desire to do that. It's a manual that I've created that's a little bit deeper dive into the topics at hand. And then the hope is you'll come back and you'll wanna be a first responder. Is there anybody here that's needing to go through the manual? You wanna raise your hand, that wants to go through it. You and I are partnering up, the Lord told me that just a little bit ago, so I got you. All right, who else? Okay, right here. And Wes, and okay, who's available to take people through the manual? Anybody? Okay, guys, I want you to look around and kind of find somebody maybe that's able to take somebody through and maybe go talk to them about participating and taking you through it, okay? All right, that's kind of how this whole thing, we don't assign people to an individual. We allow the Holy Spirit and a little bit of gumption on your part to kind of get out there and put yourself out there, okay? All right, we're gonna talk about this tonight. Exchanging inner vows for the promises of God. Have you ever said things like, this is going to be so hard, or if it's going to be like this, I'm just going to stop right here. Maybe you said things, uh, I will never treat my children the way my parents treated me. Or possibly, uh, this is is one I've caught myself, you know, I'm never going to let that happen again. If you have said something like that or something similar to that, you have just embarked into something referred to in the Bible. It's called the bitter root judgment, the Bible calls it, otherwise known as an inner vow. It's a vow that you have made 
that you have declared, that you have said, and that's the truth, according to me. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> Not according to God, according to me, since I am the little G God of my existence in that case. Vows are what we tell ourselves through our words and our thoughts. It's a pretty big deal to God. Matter of fact, the Bible says it like this. An inner vow is a generalized judgment or promise made to oneself in response to difficulty, frustration, or pain. You may be enduring something and you don't want to endure that anymore because it's creating pain in your life. And you basically just say, ah, I'm never going to do that again. When the Lord, in essence, is trying to say to you, no, we need to do this again. Treatment three times, 578 first step AA meetings. You're looking at him right here. He just kept on knocking and just saying, you need to do it again. You need to do it again. I don't want to do it again. It didn't work last time. That's an inner vow. It shouldn't be so hard. That's an inner vow. It's going to be cause a lot of pain. That's an inner vow. So we find ourselves all the time jockeying for position. And it's not, it's not like me versus you. It's me versus God. And I couldn't write my name until third grade. So guess who's going to win that one? It's not going to be me. But he's patient and he's loving and he's caring and he's merciful. And he'll just keep on knocking on that same thing over and over. We can go around this tree again. We can go around it again. It's up to you. Whenever you want to yield to the truth, then I'll stop pursuing you. But as soon as you yield to me, we'll meet in the middle. As Jay Wood just pointed out, it is not a middle, by the way. It is 100% him, and I just happened to turn around, and it, okay, I guess I did something. But it's, not, it's all, all grace, all through the mercy and grace of God that he meets us. Bible says, life and death are in the power of the tongue, and you will reap the consequences of what you say or believe. The emphasis is mine. The emphasis is, is something that I, it's implied by the verse itself. So if I declare something's going to be hard, what does the Bible say? Well, I just declared something's going to be hard with my tongue. What, what's the end result going to be? Something's going to be hard. Something's going to be difficult. You know, there are things that may not be easy, but you, you, you can just say, look, I'm going to give it my best shot and I'm going to go for it. Vows are a declaration of what we believe to be true, but may or may not have a basis in truth. Most often they are a response, like I said, to difficulty, frustration or pain. Listen, the difficulty may be true. The frustration may be true. The pain may be true. The inner vow probably is not. I'm not saying that you should deny your feelings. What I am saying is, what are you putting over the top of your feelings, declaring them as, declaring something as being true? I just, people go through marriage seminars, you know, on the weekends and stuff. And inevitably, somebody's going to stand up in front of the group, group of people, and here's what they're going to say. Marriage is hard. Yeah. Anyone, anybody want to sign up for that? Yeah, no, I, I don't forget that. No, I'm not going to sign up for that. What have you just done? You've just created an opportunity for an inner vow, a bitter root judgment against the thing called the covenant instituted by God of marriage to be hard. No, that's, that's not the truth. During pain or trauma, it's real easy to make a declaration of what is true. We say things in order to get out of the feeling that we may have around us. And the example that I turn to a lot of times is 1 Samuel chapter 14. If you'll allow me to, I kind of want to highlight what's going on in the chapter itself. So the armies of God are fighting the enemies. That is a standard process in 1 Samuel. And we see this. A guy named Saul is king. And Saul is now pursuing the enemies, but things aren't really going his way. And so here's what he says. He says this, Cursed be the man who eats food until it is evening, and I am avenged on my enemies. So this is the king. And the, whatever the king says goes. And so he just makes a declaration. He says, look, cursed 
is any guy who chooses to eat before I am avenged against my enemies. Sounds pretty noble. Sounds pretty motivational, right? That we're going to go get them. Nobody's going to even eat. Nobody's going to sleep. Nobody's going to dress until we go after these guys and we're going to get them. The problem is when you don't seek wisdom from the Lord, it, it problems ensue. Not being aware of this vow, he has a son named Jonathan. Guess what Jonathan does? He eats honey. That's a problem. Because the king just said, cursed, what he's really saying is, I'm going to kill the next guy who eats anything before I am avenged on my enemies. It's an irrational vow because he's offended by his enemies. Remember, <laughs> difficulty, frustration, or pain. You with me? He's through difficulty, he's frustrated, and he's in some pain because it's not going the way that he's, it's supposed to go. Mercifully, mercifully, Jonathan, there's a reprieve. He intercedes of the Lord on Jonathan's behalf. The Lord grants mercy. Therefore, Jonathan is not killed. All of these things could have been avoided, though. If he just would have done what? Entrusted himself to the Lord's mercy, to the Lord's direction, and not made a bitter root inner vow judgment. Some points regarding vows are this. They're really, they're egocentric. Remember the story of... Who was the problem? What did Saul declare? Until I am avenged by my enemies. Who's, who's of most importance? It's not the Lord. I assure you that. It's all about Saul. I am avenged of my enemies. Saul is personally offended and is personally frustrated. And as a result of that, he's going to make a declaration that applies to all people because he's the guy that's in pain. The next thing is they have unintended consequences. Can I get an amen on that one? Amen. Unintended consequences. 16 years old, Tammy Tyson broke my heart. I gave her everything that I was at that time, which wasn't much, but I gave her everything that I was. I, hey, I worked at Great American Music in the mall, so I, you know, um, where they actually sold albums. Do y'all remember albums? Anybody? Okay just, okay, just making sure. But they have unintended consequences. So what happens? Tammy Tyson comes along, breaks my heart. What do I say to myself? I'm never going to be hurt like that ever again. Guess what happens? I'm never going to be hurt like that ever again. What does that mean? It means I remain aloof, separate, distant, lack of intimacy in relationships. It's purely on the physical level, but no, no emotion associated with it until I did what? Until I renounced the inner vow. Until I finally took back what I had given away and said, you know what? I made a statement. I take that back. I'm going to entrust it to you, and I'm going to put myself out there. And then they usurp the will of the Lord. And you're thinking, uh, what? How can you usurp the will of God? Well, apparently we can have influence on what Christ is capable of doing or not doing. I just reference his hometown of Nazareth, in which Jesus says, I can't do very many miracles there because of their unbelief. What's the implication? He wanted to do more, but he was limited because of an unwillingness on that on the people's part, and that unwillingness usurped the will of the Lord and what the Lord wanted to do. When statements like, I will never, I must always, they all, this is going to be, when anything like that comes out of your mouth or goes into your spirit or into your heart, my soul is just determined that God is untrustworthy. And as a result of that, who needs to take authority? I need to take authority. I will never. I will always. And I'm making a statement. Vows represent an item of might of our will that overrides God's will. Might. It's an interesting word that's used in Scripture. A might carries the idea of something that is noble in its nature. It's honorable and it's reputable. The problem with using might is that it's all up to me. What does the Bible say? Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. In other words, if I have a might that something is going to be the way I say it's going to be, dang it, I could say something else, but we're in church. 
dang it, this is the way it is. God's like, okay, I'm not much I can do with that. You've already determined how it's going to be. So until you let allow me the opportunity to come in with my truth, I'm limited into what I can do. God is very clear regarding the fulfillment of truth. As we said, it's not by might. It's not by power. It's by his spirit that things are accomplished. The weakness of an inner vow is that in making it, you vow to determine the way reality is going to be. You've said it, and that's the just the way it is. Don't bother me with the truth. You've heard what your mom probably said or people have said. I have my mind made up. Don't bother me with the truth. I don't want to hear it. That's an inner vow. Um, I remember when we were moving across the street to our new house, I clearly heard from the Lord on the, this, the nature of this move, in which he said, yes, I have prepared a place for you. It's directly across the street, like literally directly across the street in this new house. It was one of the most difficult moves you ever want to make. You're thinking, oh, that was easy. No, it's like 500 trips back and forth <laughs> as opposed to just one big trip all at once. So we're, we're clearly uh, ready to move across the street and I'm creating this spreadsheet and I've got like 75 things organized and this costs this much and that costs this much and this costs that much. And I'm trying to balance the ledger and make sure it's all going to work properly. And I, no matter what I did, it, it didn't seem to work properly. And one morning I got up and I was praying and here's what the Lord said. He said, why have you stopped prophesying to my plan and you're prophesying to your plan? Nothing like a two by four right across the back of the head. Why are you declaring the way things are going to be when I've already told you how it is? But we do that with the Lord. We do that with God. Two, base, two basic areas, and we'll kind of land the plane here. We can have vows that are directed towards self, and we can have vows that are directed towards others. Self-directed vow, um, how, what's a good example? I'm terrible at managing money. Maybe you've said that. I've said it to myself. So from a physiological perspective, I have a thought and my brain will respond according to the thoughts that it receives. Not only will my brain respond to the thought that it receives, in turn, it will create chemicals that create an emotional response. So not only will I think it, I'll actually begin feeling it. You know, sweaty palms, a little tense, whatever it happens to be. In moments of high emotion, emotion is raised, we are limited because our body is being flooded with all these different chemicals in order for it to agree with my thought, what I've told myself to be true. So my body is going to line up with those chemicals. And as a free agent with a free will, the spirit of Christ, as we talked about before, is really limited as to what it can do. A self-directed vow is usually a self-fulfilling promise, usually. I mean, Job says that the, the thing I feared has come upon me. And he's referring to, you know, the difficulties in his life. Another example, I think I already used this, marriage is hard. Man, nothing like an encouraging word at a marriage conference than that, huh? <laughs> marriage is hard. No. Who determines now what marriage is? I do. What am I going to be looking for if I agree with that marriage is hard? I'm going to be looking for things in order to make marriage hard, in order to make marriage difficult. And guess what else we can do subconsciously sometimes? We can even make it harder by doing things we know we shouldn't because we're telling ourselves marriage is hard. Oh, things are going great. Everything's easy. I love my wife. Everything is fine. I gotta mess this thing up because marriage is hard. And you're laughing, but there, there are people who will usurp the beauty of the Lord in order to align themselves with the vow that they have made over themselves. But the fruit produced by an interpersonal vow is an orphan spirit, okay? I'm terrible at managing money. We've already talked about that. Marriage is hard. Self-directed inner vows produce an orphan spirit. And you're thinking, what in the world is an orphan spirit? Orphan spirits, think of an orphan. Woundedness, keep people at a distance, never trust, find fault, 
Don't be authentic, be elusive, and use people's weakness whenever necessary. That's what an orphan says. And when you have an inner vow, a bitter root judgment in this is the way life is for me, you're going to deny anything that comes contrary to that. You're going to distance yourself from people. You're not going to listen to messages. You're going to find fault in what somebody said. 98.7% of what they said is in line with truth, but they didn't, you know, drop the I and add, a, and add an EY. I don't know, whatever. You're going to find something in order to dismiss the truth being presented to you. Maybe you didn't like his shirt. I don't know. It's whatever it happens to be. You will find something. Um, another one. I will never be poor when I grow up. Or I will always be poor. Either way, it works both sides, right? Who just became Lord of your finances? It wasn't God. I can assure you, I'll just leave you with that one, okay? The question then becomes, do we double down and continue with these inner vows, or do we allow the Spirit of Christ to heal us from the inside? Do you forgive yourself for ever seeing yourself as poor, let's say? Listen, if the value of something is determined by how much someone will give for it, we need to reevaluate our worth. Think about it. I love you all. You're not getting my son. If it was you or him, I love you. I'll see you in heaven. No, God thought so highly of you that he gave the most valuable, precious commodity in the history of the world for you. We should reconsider how much we're worth and the value that we have. And in a vow directed towards somebody else, um, that's a good statement. Anyone who looks like them is foolish, selfish, and can't see truth. I'm going to land the plane tonight and just go right after a real life scenario. Okay. There was a shooting today in Tennessee and that shooting was done by a 28 year old man who identifies as a transgender woman. Why they are promoting the fact that he's a transgender woman is beyond me. When was the last time you, you heard uh, of a school shooting in which they identified the shooter as a 19 year old heterosexual male? What are they trying to do? Don't kid yourself. What are they trying to do? They're trying to take your bitter root judgments against this particular race, creed, sexual orientation, people, whatever it happens to be. They're trying to take that anger and that frustration and that pain, you with me? And they're just trying to rise it up all the way to the top. All transgender people are crazy like that. You gotta be careful, they're gonna shoot you. We do the very same thing that's been done on the other, quote unquote, the other way. Be alert. They want you to agree with a lie. The reality is not all transgender people are like that. They're not, and they need to be prayed for. God loves them, he does. And he wants them to change, not change their transsexualness, change in order to become more of who he created them to be. And by default, that will inevitably go away. But we're so big on labels and big on judgments on the external because anyone who looks like them is foolish, selfish, and can't see the truth. And we've judged a person. Is there any way for you to know that seeing somebody walk down the street? Absolutely not. Have you spent time talking to them? Do you get to know them at all? Do guys with tattoos, are they all drug addicts? Well, it's not a bad example. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but I'm not a drug addict today. Thank you, Don. Um, nor was I day one 24 years ago, like you've heard me say. Listen, but here, here's the problem. If you've ever encountered somebody that, ha that has a bitter root judgment, you cannot talk them out of that opinion. Are you with me? Yeah, I mean, you can give them information, you give them the statistics, you can give them the truth of God's word, which is 
more powerful than anything else, they just refuse. Why? Because it's become part of their identity, part of who they are as a person. And if they let go of that, they feel as though they're letting go of themselves. So tonight, it's an idol, ultimately. And that's what they do with their opinion. Anything we idolize receives our affection. The giving of our affection produces confidence in our position because it becomes part of who we are. Part of who we are. It becomes our identity. And here's the last truth. Anything you receive from the Lord does not need to be validated by others in order to be true. And you're thinking, well, you need biblical wisdom and biblical... I'm not saying don't get biblical wisdom and biblical counsel. That's not what I'm saying. The Lord has clearly spoken. And you can hear the voice of God. I don't need your approval, quote unquote, if you know what I mean. I mean, I like it. It would help encourage me. But ultimately, it's really your decision. Let's go after it. Admit. Leviticus 5 4 says, Suppose you made a, fool, a foolish, excuse me, or suppose you make a foolish vow of any kind, whether its purpose is for good or bad, or bad, or bad I should say. When you realize it's foolishness, you must admit it. Maybe you made a vow. And now thinking about it, you're like, what? who told me that? Why did I ever agree with that in the first place? Well, if you, if you acknowledge it, just admit it. That's what I did. I've said it. Marriage is going to be hard. It's going to be weird. Dating stinks. Okay, guess welcome to dating that stinks, I guess. I, I don't know. But admit it. Renounce it. But we have renounced underhand, disgraceful underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or, excuse me, cunning or to tamper with God's truth. And renounce it. Speak out loud against it. I admit that I have said that's going to be hard. I don't know who told me that, but I just agreed with it. I don't want to agree with that anymore. I don't agree with that anymore. And then you confess the truth. If we confess the truth, in other words, make it our own to say the same as what God says. Homo legeo is the word there. It means to say the same as God. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Pretty simple method. So tonight, think of, think of one inner vow that you may have made. Maybe two. Admit it to the group. This is what I said. Just like today I said this. I renounce it, and I confess the truth. God can cleanse me from that, and I don't have to abide in that anymore. Amen? Okay. But in, in all sincerity, we do need to be praying for the families in Tennessee. Um, it's a Christian school. Uh, this person was a former student of this Christian school, and I don't even know a count. I, I don't go in that much in depth. I just know they need our prayers. We need to do that. So we're going to pray for them. And we're going to close. If you're new, you're just going to stay in this room. Okay? Guys, you're going to go to room 204. Ladies, you're going to go to room 202. It's just across the hallway. But let's pray. Let's pray. Father, um, we don't know what those people need in Tennessee right now. You do. And so we entrust it to you right now. They need healing we know that but what type of healing God we trust that entrust that to you we speak against division we speak against these root judgments that will rise up in people and create even more chaos and instead of ushering in a spirit of peace they're going to usher in a spirit of chaos and God, we ask that those voices would be silenced. But we know that there are people there that need you. Be with them. May the love of the Father be real to them right now. God, thank you for these lives that are here tonight, what they represent as they consider where they have made an inner vow. Thank you for your mercy and your kindness towards them. If we confess... You are faithful, Lord, if we confess. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen.
Amen. All right.